Well, officially, welcome to the first of the Gender Institute's launch events. And thank you for supporting the Gender Institute at Royal Holloway University of London. The Gender Institute was founded in 2020 with seed funding from the British Academy. And it looks to become a hub for the study, teaching, and learning, and activism about gender and sexuality on campus. The Institute has three primary missions to support faculty and student research and research collaboration around the study of gender and sexuality, to support the teaching and learning around gender and sexuality, and to produce resources for community engagement and impact around gender and sexuality. And we hope this launch event is an introduction to all of those. We're excited to launch the programming of the Gender Institute today with the talk by Professor Raywin Canal. Raywin Cannell is Professor Emerita at the University of Sydney and a life member of the National Tertiary Education Union in Australia. She became well known for her research on large class dynamics and on how class and gender hierarchies are made and remade in everyday life in schools. She subsequently developed a social theory of gender relations, which emphasized that gender is a large scale and dynamic social structure, not just a matter of personal identity. Her studies on masculinity have been widely cited and widely used in classrooms and universities across the world. She's been an advisor to uh, UNESCO and a wide variety of other policy initiatives relating to men, boys, masculinity, gender equality, and peacemaking. As of 2017, her book Masculinities had been cited over 15,000 times and had been translated into 10 languages. In addition to her work on gender, Raywin has worked on Southern theory and on understanding contemporary university structures and politics. Her long career in academia and activism can be seen as a model for current and future generations. Please help me welcome her talk at the Gender Institute's inaugural launch event about feminist thought and global political economy of knowledge. I'm going to turn the floor over to Raywin. Thank everyone for coming and uh, I look forward to the talk myself. Congratulations on the launch of the Gender Institute. That's terrific. Um, and I'm, I'm very honoured to, to be here in, in this session. Um, with the, the beginnings of any new program, uh, one of few basic tasks, obviously, is to define the agenda. And that is what I hope to make a little contribution to today. Um, I'm speaking to you from Sydney in Australia, um, a country whose name literally means the Southland. Uh, it's a settler colonial country, which is relevant to some of the story I'll be telling today. I come from a, a particular generation too, a um, generation which uh, grew up in intellectually and politically in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, here's Australian Feminism in 1975, um, International Women's Day. Uh, I published my first paper on gender the year before, in 1974. It was a pretty terrible paper, um, but at least it was on some of the right topics. And um, I was learning at the time that, that feminism... Um, and the new uh, sexual politics uh, were dangerous ideas, folks, uh, as I think they still are. And they were dangerous for intellectual work, intellectual workers too. In fact, I, I would, I, I argued, came to learn and argue um, that uh, the new analysis of, of gender and sexuality implied in fact, a, a revolutionary transformation in intellectual life. Um, and uh, that in, in several, uh, several different ways. Um, firstly, it saw new historical subjects uh, coming onto the scene as uh, 
the, the point was put by Julieta Kirkwood, the pioneering feminist theorist in Chile, um, where uh, the mobilization of women uh, created a collective identity, a new kind of politics based on a specific form of oppression which had not been much recognized in political processes and democratic politics before. Uh, the new politics also implied new themes for investigation in the humanities, social sciences, and in the natural sciences, though that's often forgotten. And it required new concepts, concepts like patriarchy, one of the central ideas of, of women's liberation, the notion of the gender order, um, slightly later theorizing, but understanding those, uh, you know, not as as uh, abstract philosophical ideas, but as very concrete social structures, as the site of conflict, as the site of oppression, and as the site, too, of dynamic changes and uh, shifts in, in history, which the women's liberation movement itself epitomised and, and theorised. Now, for someone like me, a, a, an academic worker, um, these, these changes in, in consciousness and, and politics, new forms of mobilisation, also opened new research agendas. And I just want to illustrate this with a, a project, research project, collective, uh, cooperative research project that I was involved in in the 1970s, published in the 1980s, in a book which I'm still very proud of, and I'm glad to say the, the research team are still friends 40 years later. How's that? Um, so in, in this project, which involved us interviewing hundreds of uh, kids in high school, their parents, their teachers, visits to schools and so on and so forth, quite an intensive piece of, of, of work, I learned to speak in that project of the gender regimes of institutions. I uh, was very clear once when uh, saw, saw it in, in front of you nose, so to speak, um, how one school differed from another in the way that it handled gender issues. In that project also, I became very much aware of the existence of multiple forms of masculinity, often in the same institution, in very definite relationships with each other. And that project, in fact, was where the, the concept of hegemonic masculinity was first formulated and where I saw the empirical evidence for patterns of hegemony um, in relations among masculinities and femininities. And we also saw in that project very concretely projects of change in gender relations because we were doing this at a time when school teachers were in fact a very important group in feminism, as I think they still are. Um, and many teachers, whether or not they were connected formally with the, the women's liberation movement, well, you could hardly be connected formally, but whether they were uh, active participants in the movement were nevertheless undertaking projects of change in gender relations, in the vocational preparation of girls, in the uh, attempt to, to shift oppressive gender and sexual patterns in school life itself. These things were happening at the grassroots level in the institutions at the same time as mobilisation on the larger uh, scale was happening in the society at large. And that was a really important set of learnings for me, uh, on which I guess I have built ever since. And although the language in which I now speak of this is somewhat different uh, from, from those early days, I think it was then that I really began to understand one of the most important facts about gender is that it is cultural, all right, but it is also embodied, and those things work together in gender relations, in the 
forming of particular patterns of gender in personal life and gender relations in everyday life in the process of historical change that grows out of existing patterns, transforms them and creates new realities of gender and gender relations. That's a, a, a kind of process that I now call, uh, using a bit of philosophical jargon, ontoformative social processes. Uh, uh, basically summarising the, 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 the fact uh, recognised throughout gender politics that gender relations are created through time. They're not fixed. They're not prior to human social life. They're created in human social life and change over time. Now, when we begin thinking about the historicity of gender, it's another way of saying what I'm talking about, we have to think also on the large of, of, about history on the large scale, and uh, as I mentioned uh, at the start of my talk, uh, I live in a, a, a settler colonial country that is a product of European colonization. Its contemporary social structure is largely a product of European colonization over the last couple of hundred years. And therefore, the, the society I live in um, is part of a larger history of the expansion of global empires, the colonization of just in one form or another, of just about every other uh, part of the world, and the creation of colonial societies. And that is one of the, the, the crucial parts of human history uh, over the last uh, half, half millennium. Here is a 19th century artist's impression of what that was like in Australia. Um, this comes from a 19th century Australian magazine. They're a little um, out of uh, order in their picturing of the Aboriginal warriors, but the fact of a violent conflict and of the, um, you know, the uh, process of uh, violent uh, destruction of colonial populations and societies is absolutely characteristic of imperialism everywhere. So our history, uh, the recent history of humanity to a very, very considerable extent is the story of the creation of of, of colonial societies, then of struggles for decolonization, the creation of post-colonial societies, the creation of the global markets that have now largely replaced the old um, formal political empires, and the development of global communication systems, global, corpora global corporations, and so on. Now, once we recognise that, um, then we should also recognise, and this is much less recognised, that colonisation, the growth of empire, the creation of colonial societies was itself gendered. So empire was a gendered project from the start. Um, it was largely undertaken by colonising workforces uh, which were strongly masculinized, and the process of colonization itself constructed and transformed masculinities of the both the colonizers and the colonizers uh, and the colonized. Uh, this is a point that is made in a brilliant book by the uh, Indian uh, intellectual Ashish Nandi. Very interesting psychologist, cultural analyst, and cultural historian, uh, who wrote a tremendous book um, back in the 1980s called The Intimate Enemy about the interplay of masculinities among the colonizers and the colonized in British India, in the Indian Raj. But it's not just, of course, about that interaction, the impact of colonization on gender orders basically tore apart many existing 
gender orders. This certainly happened in Australia through rape of Indigenous women in Africa and the uh, Americas through the, the institution of slavery and the massive Atlantic slave trade. These two um, were gendered processes which reshaped gender relations in very, very dramatic ways. We could even say that race, which is a very characteristic social form constructed in empire, in colonial societies and in empires as a whole, is one of the characteristic social divisions that is woven in with gender in the story of imperialism and coloniality. For instance, in the work of Uma Chakravarti on the, the Indian historian, feminist historian, uh, who's on the left in this picture of one of her classes, uh, Uma has written very interestingly about caste, arguing that the, the hierarchies of caste which the British colonisers crystallised and used as techniques of rule are almost a form of gender in themselves, that they are very centrally bound up with gender relations and, of course, transformed gender relations as the caste system itself evolved. Or well, turning to... to um, uh, to South America, this is Mara Viveros, uh, a, a um, remarkable uh, feminist theorist and researcher from Colombia in uh, South America, uh, who's traced this kind of process up to the present in the uh, multiple forms of gender politics that emerge in the different racial groups that have been created by the colonial history of um, Spanish-speaking South America and in the post-colonial societies and politics that have developed uh, since independence in the early 19th century. We can even see the connections, the colonial connections um, in uh, between uh, gender and race uh, in the present, in the Anglosphere, um, in the rhetoric of the late unlamented Trump regime uh, with its attempt to stigmatise marginalised ethnic groups, particularly those of Latina origin, um, as rapists, as sexual offenders and as threats to white uh, American women. So gender is, I would argue, interwoven with the story of empire uh, and uh, colonial and post-colonial societies in very deep and powerful ways. And why I'm telling this story is that I think this connection, these connections, the connections between empire and gender also work in the construction of knowledge, in the materials that we work with in the academic world, the concepts we use, uh, even the, the kinds of projects that we undertake and what we think is, is worth researching. And I want to make that point but just by going back one step and arguing that the, the modern economy of knowledge, the dominant knowledge formation on which university curricula are built is shaped in a global economy with a very significant resemblance to the extractive and exchange economy created by empire and now developed in new ways in the, in the global capitalist economy of, of our day. And one of the crucial features of this economy in the realm of knowledge is a relationship between the global metropole, the imperial centers of North America and Western Europe and the colonized world, the rest of the, the world, where the imperial centers send out uh, expeditions to engage basically in data mining parallel to what was happening in the realm of 
of natural resources. And here is an illustration of that, which is connected with one of the most important gender theorists of the 19th century. This is a British Royal Navy vessel called the Beagle, which many of you will recognize the name. It's shown in front of a famous mountain in southern Chile, where it had got to in its three-year data-gathering voyage around the world. And although you can't see him on board the ship, at this time was a young biologist by the name of Charles Darwin. And the data that he brought back, geological uh, and as well as uh, observations in biology, were part of what went into the evolutionary revolution in biology, which kick-started uh, the whole of modern biological science. So it's not a trivial uh, episode that we are seeing here, but it was multiplied hundreds of times as um, data was collected around the colonised world for just about a full range of disciplines, you know, from linguistics to astronomy, uh, natural science, medical science, social science, sociology is deeply involved in this kind of process. Data flows developed from the colonised periphery back to the imperial centre where they were theorised so that the imperial centre became the centre of, became the site, if you like, of a theoretical moment in global science including methodology, formal theorising and the aggregation of data. And that is still a function which is principally performed in the global north as the role of the global south is you know, to still, to a very large extent, the role of supplying data. Uh, even in areas like climate change, where the data gathering is increasingly automated, that geographical and social relationship still actually dominates the global economy of knowledge. And one has to say that gender research is no exception. Uh, this is also true if we go back into the history of um, what we now call, might call gender studies or studies of sexuality, a significant part of that history is colonial data mining. And this is done by people who are very significant figures in our area, significant feminist thinkers such as Margaret Mead, whose professional occupation was, of course, that of an anthropologist and who brought back from her several trips to the colonised world, uh, what became very influential data, uh, arguing for a social constructionist theory of gender. So although our, the, the, most of the well-known theorists in uh, gender research, and I think this is also true of sexuality research to the extent that they're separated, are um, do come from the, the global north, uh, do come from the global metropole, Simone de Beauvoir, Judith Butler, and so on. Uh, nevertheless, the discipline as a whole has rested to a significant extent on flows of information from other parts of the world. So we too, in gender research, for all the revolutionary potential that I was speaking of before, are still part of the dominant economy of knowledge, which works in very unequal ways on a world scale. Now that might sound rather depressing, and uh, it's certainly uh, something that uh, can be a bit of a shock when you come um, in touch with this argumentation uh, for the first time. There are books of gender theory um, that I'm uh, familiar with, for instance, which really have no reference to any thinkers uh, outside the global north, except perhaps a few white theorists in settler colonies like Australia, um, 
basically the intellectual production of what would have been 80, 70, 80% of the world is absent from many representations of what theory is about in gender studies. But this doesn't have to be. And this is an argument now which is increasingly made, uh, not just in gender studies, of course, but in the humanities and social sciences more widely, and uh, is even heard from time to time in the natural sciences, and, and rightly so. So I know that there are decolonizing movements already in Global North universities in Britain, <clears throat> for instance, the Why Is My Curriculum White movement or the current uh, debates about post-colonial, about decolonizing the curriculum. In the United States, uh, for quite some time now, there's been significant attention to black feminist thought in the global metropole itself and then its connections, uh, especially with, with African thought. And that points to the existence of other frameworks for knowledge, uh, other knowledge formations, as I would put it, um, which are alternatives to the research-based knowledge formation, which is dominant in the university world. Uh, for instance, uh, indigenous knowledges, um, which uh, have not been wiped out by the um, destruction of, of colonization, or not, certainly have not been wholly wiped out and are currently undergoing a significant cultural revival. Um, there are forms of knowledge, indigenous knowledge, that are very specifically gendered. For instance, in Australian Aboriginal culture, there are ceremonies and forms of knowledge, as well as forms of labour, that are socially assigned to women um, and which are you know, in, in uh, parallel uh, with men's rituals and forms of knowledge and just as complex and elaborate. There are alternative universalisms. Um, uh, indigenous knowledges are typically connected with particular place, with the land, as Australian Indigenous people put it. But there are also um, universal forms of knowledge which are not tied to particular place or land and claim, like research-based knowledge, a certain degree of, of universality. Uh, for instance, the knowledge that's embedded in Islamic jurisprudence, um, which uh, is itself uh, an elaborated and complex system of knowledge and practices uh, with its specialists, with its, its complex and uh, um, uh, elaborate literature, and with its feminist wing too, because there is Islamic feminism and is, uh, is, uh, feminist arguments in Islamic jurisprudence. There's also argument, although people in the Anglosphere uh, rarely know this, uh, about issues, uh, about trans issues in Islamic jurisprudence. And Iran, uh, since the Islamic revolution there, uh, bringing a, 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 a Shiite regime to power uh, is one of the few places in the world, countries, I suppose one could say, um, where trans existence is not only legalized uh, but has religious authority uh, behind it. Um, and uh, that is something really worth pondering about, uh, given the uh, common views of, of um, uh, the gender politics of, of Islamic thought. Uh, well, in fact, uh, I'm going right on to talk about feminist movements in colonised and uh, post-colonial societies. Um, and the, uh, I want, again, to go back in history to Islamic majority colonies uh, in this case, the Dutch East Indies, uh, now Indonesia, 
this is uh, the only surviving photograph, uh, about 120 years old now, of Cartini, uh, whom most feminists in the Anglosphere, regrettably, don't know about, but who is a national heroine in Indonesia and a kind of patron saint of women's organisations in Indonesia. She was a feminist thinker, um, particularly concerned with women's education, uh, the author of a best-selling uh, set of, um, of letters, which were um, uh, in included uh, extensive discussions of, of the issue. Uh, of changing women's position through education, and which became something of a classic of colonial literature, unfortunately, after Cartini's own death in, in, at a, a very sadly young age. Um, moving to another part of the Islamic majority world, uh, to Egypt, at the time basically a British colony, um, under indirect rule, but, but effectively a British colony. This is Huda Sharawi, uh, the organiser of the uh, Egyptian Feminist Union, an important figure in the development of gender-based activism uh, in the colonised world. And I could go on, you know, um, quite extensively, I'm sure some of you could too, adding to the story of things uh, of, of uh, political movements, of the work of uh, intellectuals in uh, colonised, uh, of, of colonised societies uh, as resources for understanding gender dynamics. Uh, and what is true of feminist movements, I think, is now also increasingly uh, true of trans movements. Uh, here I will indulge in a, an autobiographical moment. Um, this is a photograph of a meeting that I had some years back uh, with a trans support group in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, um, which illustrates uh, very obviously the diversity of uh, trans uh, organising uh, in that part of the world. And where I learned through my discussions with this and, and other groups about the different agendas, the different political concerns, uh, the trans women in Global South uh, locations, Global South societies are likely to have compared with trans activism in the Global North, the different policy priorities these groups might have the different problems that, that is faced in practical life of, of poverty and, and violence, and the kinds of knowledges that might be generated from, from that experience. It's a very, very illuminating and uh, exciting experience for me, which I've now begun to try to uh, um, to, to crystallise and begin to, to publish some thoughts from. So, uh, for, you know, from, from that example, you can see that I'm highly interested in what gender dynamics and sexuality um, in Global South contexts might have to feed into a more genuinely inclusive and participatory gender studies and sexuality studies on a world scale, on a genuinely world scale. The genres of work might be different from the uh, classic Global North uh, referee journal, uh, which has been, I have to say, my uh, principal <laughs> um, genre of, of publication, but which I, like many others in, in this meeting, I'm sure, uh, try to move beyond. There are different genres, and there are, are very certainly different agendas, different priorities in feminist thought in Global South context too. And I want to, to bring this to, uh, uh, to, to these you know, very general 
observations to some concrete uh, a point by, by introducing uh, four people that I regard as uh, among uh, the, the really interesting uh, feminist intellectuals who should have global reputations um, in at least one case does, uh, but who should be high on the, um, the reading lists and uh, attention, I think, of, of gender analysts today. The first is someone who's thought hard about the point I was making earlier about the violence of colonization, the dis enormous disruption of colonized cultures and societies that resulted uh, from the violent advent of, of colonial rule. Uh, this is Amina Mama, um, African uh, feminist thinker now, I think working in, in the United States, um, who has written uh, very effectively about exactly this issue, uh, about the significance of colonizing violence for the disruption of pre-colonial um, African societies and the connections of that colonizing violence and disruption to the patterns of gender-based violence that exist today. It's a, a connection that uh, is not actually visible in some Global North thinking about gender-based violence, um, even that which uses an intersectional frame. But when we think about gender-based violence on a world scale, that issue is tremendously important, not just for Africa, but for the stories of, in Latin America, in South Asia, in the Pacific and in East Asia as well. Uh, that is an issue that gender studies on a world scale must treat as a really major problem. And we owe that to people like Amina Mama uh, for articulating uh, the issue so strongly. The second issue um, that I think that, that comes out very strongly from Global South work on gender is the significance of regional gender histories and, and what we might call the macro structures of gender, the patterns of the economic and large-scale institutional structures of gender. Now, this has been a particular um, concern of Teresita de Barbieri, um, feminist theorist from Uruguay originally, although uh, she had to leave Uruguay at the time the, of the, di the dictatorship came in there, moved to Chile and then eventually to Mexico, uh, where uh, uh, very fortunately I, I met her not long before she died. Um, Teresita is, uh, I, I think, almost unsighted in the Anglosphere, and I don't think uh, much or, uh, of her work uh, has ever been translated, um, so it, it has to be accessed uh, in, in Spanish or through Spanish. Um, but it is an extraordinarily sophisticated social science-based synthesis of issues about economic change, about race, about class dynamics, uh, issues that are, you know, massively important in progressive social thought across Latin America, um, but in her work very particularly is brought to focus on the construction of gender. Uh, she is, in fact, one of the first important gender theorists, I think, to see the significance of issues about masculinity and build that in a strong way into uh, her theorising of, of uh, continent-wide uh, social processes. So I have great uh, respect uh, for her work and have learned a great deal from it. Third issue that I want to raise is one which also is, is almost absent from many forms of uh, social theory in the global north, practically absent. Uh, from 
my theorising in, in my discipline of sociology, but which is absolutely central to processes of colonisation and to thinking about the nature of colonial society, uh, populations and gender relations. So the person who is front and centre in thinking about this uh, is an Indian feminist development economist, Bina Agarwal, whom I'm sure many of you will know, as she has a very considerable reputation in development economics and in um, uh, actually in, in uh, feminist thinking about environmental issues. Uh, Bina's great work, um, uh, a book that I have enormous respect for, is called A Field of One's Own. It's a deliberate take on Virginia Woolf, of course, uh, but it's about land and land ownership and land rights uh, in relation to gender, particularly women's access to uses of ownership of land, how this plays out in families, uh, in local politics, and then in the policy level, in larger political structures. It's a stunning piece of work. I think it's one of the great works of modern feminism. And uh, Bina Agarwal, to my mind, is perhaps the most important uh, feminist theorist of our time. Um, it's a very, very impressive, grounded in enormous amount of empirical knowledge, investigation, um, and it's only one part of her work, uh, stunning stuff. Uh, and finally, um, not to leave the men out, um, I want to, to come to issues about masculinity and the tendency in a great deal of popular discussions to assume that when we speak of traditional masculinity, we're, we're speaking of patriarchal masculinity, of, of abusive, aggressive, domineering types of masculinity. And here I think it's really important, anyone interested in these kinds of issues really needs to read the work of Kopano Ratele, a South African psychologist um, who is one of the most interesting writers about um, questions of masculinity today and has written a brilliant analysis of exactly this issue of traditions in masculinity and made the, to me, completely convincing uh, argument that traditions in masculinity are not just patriarchal. There are also democratic traditions in the lives of men, in men's enactment of, of gender, um, and indeed the history of feminisms will give some important clues to that. And there are negotiations around the meanings of masculinity and the uses of traditions which can be put to, uh, to new and progressive use in the present. So Copano in one of his papers tells the lovely story of a couple of gay men in South Africa who used the tradition, absolutely traditional forms of marriage with the ascent of family and community to celebrate their marriage, their partnership uh, in what was both a highly traditional and a very new way. It's really terrific work and I strongly, uh, strongly recommend it to you. And those are only four of the the uh, recent uh, theorists, and there are many, many more. Um, so there are rich resources out there for gender studies on a world scale, which are not always easily accessed through our bibliographical aids uh, in, in academia, uh, but with, with patience can be found. So I want to bring my my remarks uh, to a close now, uh, having made that case, and I hope given some examples that will interest you, um, I want to, to come right to the present um, and, and make the compulsory mention of the COVID-19 epidemic. 
which is why I'm here and you're there and we are not in the same room at the moment. COVID-19 to me uh, is uh, above all a social disaster. Um, it's an embodied social disaster and it has an important gender dimension, as I'm sure you all know. The care workers uh, who look after the patients in the hospitals um, and um, in, in outpatient care who are working with COVID-19 sufferers are 70% women. That's a broad global average of the gender division of labour in, in health care. That's one important part of the uh, uh, the gender aspects of the of the pandemic. Uh, we all know, I think, also the um, um, now uh, very widespread documentation of a rise in domestic violence that speaks to the um, the dynamics of of violence when people are confined uh, to uh, patriarchal households. Uh, we've seen, perhaps this is less um, uh, proclaimed, but there's also very considerable evidence of rising uh, economic precarity on the part of women and women-headed households as a result of the way the pandemic pans out and its economic consequences are handled uh, by corporations and governments. Uh, women have been marginalised in much of the decision making and that is something that you are, I'm sure, just as familiar with as, as I am. It struck me, in fact, um, that uh, the uh, uh, COVID-19, the responses, official responses to the COVID-19 epidemic have strikingly missed what were important learnings from earlier epidemics, the HIV AIDS epidemic, for instance, before the advent of, of you know, uh, hard antiretroviral medicines, the effective response was basically a community response, a change in sexual practices, the development of the safe sex strategy, which largely occurred within gay communities uh, initially. The Ebola virus too, although this is less uh, well known, the communities affected by the Ebola virus in West Africa largely worked out the, the uh, epidemiology of Ebola themselves and developed their own um, uh, collective responses to handling the epidemic and in particular uh, burying the dead in ways that uh, prevented further transmission of a, a highly um, infectious virus. Um, so gay networks and women's networks in the Ebola case were very central in evolving responses to epidemics. Unfortunately, in the government reactions uh, to COVID-19 so far, there's been very little attention to collective action from below the very techniques uh, which feminists and, and uh, gay activists have been strong in developing. And I think as the uh, COVID epidemic in some sense normalizes and the limits of the uh, vaccines become clear, that collective action uh, will uh, be absolutely needed and it will be in our heritage that some of the resources for that uh, can can be found. So in the present as in the past I argue uh, for the full development of the possibilities in gender and sexuality studies we need the wealth of intellectual and practical resources that come from the majority world, the global south, the world outside the global metropole. Now, this is not a new thought. Um, I'm, I'm by no means a pioneer of, of these ideas. For instance, I uh, would 
want to acknowledge the work of my Australian colleague, feminist sociologist called Chula Bulbeck, uh, who published uh, more than 20 years ago a very sophisticated discussion of the issues that are involved in linking feminist perspectives uh, across continents and across cultures. Um, so there is a tradition here, there are resources for this too, uh, as we uh, try to develop global perspectives uh, in the present. So those are my thoughts on the subject. Um, I wish you well in building the Gender Institute and its projects. I hope you have uh, just as exciting an experience doing this as I have had in my time in these fields of research. These are not easy fields to work in. They can be hard, they can uh, be, be tough on, on the researchers. Um, and involve struggle to create and keep space in academic institutions. But those struggles are, are absolutely worth pursuing because the knowledge that we can generate, I think, is now needed more than ever before. Thank you. And as my last gesture, I'm going to put up a slide giving the spelling of the names of the people I've been talking about. So, thank you very much. Um, if it's all right with you, I'll field some questions. Sure thing. Okay. Um, if anybody has questions, uh, then you can either raise your hand or put them in the chat. Um, and uh, perhaps as people get ready to do that, I will take the chair's initiative and ask the first question. Um, which is how contextually, like how has your understanding of different masculinities changed contextually over time? Um, good question. <laughs> um, and uh, immediately I have to do a little computing. Um, uh, about earlier and, and and later. I think early on, I thought the problem was fairly simple. Um, that there was, I mean, this was something that, that we could see and I'm working with collaborators in, in this work in the 70, 1970s and 80s. Um, we could see almost immediately that there were hierarchies in patterns of masculinity. There were, in in small scale situations like schools, large scale situations like the the whole um, of Australian society, uh, there were powerful, more authoritative masculinities and more marginalised ones. And that, I guess, was the the model that. Um, uh, that I was working with in the 1980s and uh, that was good enough to produce the first account uh, of hegemonic masculinity and, you know, hegemonised masculinities. Uh, on the strength of that um, thinking, um, I launched some research on involving life history interviews with different groups of adult men. And that became eventually the empirical chapters of my book, Masculinities. And of course, as soon as you get into some solid empirical data, uh, things become complicated. Um, and some of the patterns that, uh, that uh, we'd, we'd sort of suggested theoretically, you know, it could be seen indeed, it could be illustrated. Uh, in the data, but other things couldn't, or at least do, uh, we, we, we didn't initially have the, uh, the means to see them. Um, so the, the model became more complicated. In, in the book Masculinities, which came out in the mid-90s, uh, 
Uh, I was suggesting four broad categories of masculinity, or at least locations in which masculinities might develop in the gender order. And I think one of the things I was beginning to get at there was later articulated much more clearly by, by other researchers, including some colleagues in the United States, um, which was the different masculinities can uh, hybridise with each other. Um, and that some masculinities can be constructed by incorporating um, <coughs> uh, elements uh, of socially defined femininity too. Um, so there's now very interesting research literature about hybrid masculinities, um, which is making the picture of hegemony a good deal more complex than in our first you know, attempts to map it. The, the issue which I've worked on as, as this people, other people took up this development um, and which I guess is the, the, the biggest change in my own thinking about it, uh, was working on Southern theory and coming in contact with um, the um, uh, range of intellectual workers in the Global South and with literatures that I simply hadn't encountered before working as I mostly did within the Anglosphere and in a, in a university system in Australia, which is very strongly dependent on the British and, and US models. Um, so I then uh, became aware that my own thinking was itself, uh, you know, constrained in a colonial pattern and I needed to try to break out of that. So I've tried in some of my more recent writing over the last, I suppose, eight years or so, um, tried to bring the literature about masculinity into contact with the decolonial, postcolonial uh, and Southern theory arguments and think about um, he hegemony in gender relations as itself something that might be specific to certain situations in the whole imperial picture. And we might think of certain of processes of colonization and decolonization as having very clear effects on hegemony and gender relations, such that the very concept of hegemonic masculinity might become problematic in a colonizing or decolonizing situation. And we might, rather than think of hegemonic masculinity as if it were a fixed form or an identity, we might think of it better as a project, uh, as something which is uh, partly embodied in the social practices of a particular group, which is being brought into existence perhaps over a period of time in a certain social situation where hegemony did not exist at the start. And here I'm drawing, you know, exactly on the work of the uh, Indian Subaltern Studies Group, um, where uh, who uh, brought uh, strongly into question uh, the notion that uh, British, uh, uh, the British colonial regime had hegemony in Indian society. Uh, Ranajit Guha wrote a whole monograph. Uh, on on this issue. And I think the same question has to be raised in gender relations in relation to colonization. And that, of course, is a large part of world history. Um, so I think it's a big issue, um, one which is very much an open one at, at the moment, but it's where my work has, has headed in, in recent years. Thank you, I appreciate it a lot. Um, I just wanted to let you know there's a comment in the chat, it's not a question, but the comment is that the resources were so useful that I should make sure the Royal Holloway Library has them on offer <laughs> so that people can uh, check and use them for their research and work. That would be um, great so I will uh, follow up on that to make sure that those resources are available. Good. I'll start uh, a new career as a book salesman. <laughs> Excellent. 
Um, okay, so uh, does anybody else have questions? Um, let me see if they keep people cut. Uh, so here's another comment in the chat. Thank you so much for a great talk, particularly for someone like me who explores gender in non-Western contexts. Indeed, I teach a history module on gender in Muslim societies and include work by Afsania Nibjabadi. Sorry, I'm not very good at this. I mispronounce my own last name sometimes on the reading list. So it would be great to hear your thoughts if you have any on professing selves the study in which she explores the challenge for people in the West understanding where transsexuality fits into the Iranian context. Yeah. Context. Um, it, it's, it's a book I know, um, really very, very fascinating. And for trans studies, I think quite an important text. Um, so I learned a great deal from it. Uh, I, I do have a little bit of a problem with the, it seems to me still um, largely dependent on, on Global North conceptual frameworks. So it's written within um, a certain episteme, if you like. Um, and, and that is, you know, this is hardly a criticism. This is normal in studies of, of uh, gender and sexuality. Uh, but it seems to me the material in the book is already pointing beyond this. And that's what really excited me about it because the book has a very interesting encounter uh, with one of the, um, one of the clerics uh, in Iran who has made a specialty uh, of uh, questions about transsexuality uh, within the paradigm of Islamic jurisprudence, which I was mentioning before as one of the knowledge systems that we should recognise as a possible, uh, as a resource for understanding these areas. Um, so, uh, Absolutely, a book to read and learn from. I'm um, very much indebted to, to the author for my um, what, what understanding I have of, of these issues in uh, not just in Iran, but, but of course in, in other parts of the Shiite uh, world. Great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, all right, so let's see if there are any more questions. Here's another question. I have a question on technology and gender. How do you view the impact of technology on gender-related issues? Wow. <laughs> How many days have we got for this answer? Um, look, it's not a field of my own research, but I've, I've, I've read some fabulous work uh, that's been done in that, including, if I can put in another plug for Australian feminist scholarship, the work of Judy Weissman, um, who's written great, great stuff on uh, on a high tech industry, for instance, and and um, gender issues, the um, uh, position of women in in that world. I've also read some, you know. Um, absolutely fascinating work about the uh, development of, of tissue economies, of how the parts of the human body, including blood, um, uh, which I suppose counts as a tissue, um, uh, are now um, subject to, to harvesting and trade on a world scale so that there are neo-colonial flows of blood, of plasma, um, and so forth, uh, through different different parts of the world, and um, coming from largely from poorer countries, going to richer countries. What the gender dynamics dynamics of this part of the story is, I'm I'm not at all sure. Um, but one thing that uh, excites me about that is how it can connect uh, in a new way um, the, you know, the analysis of the bodily processes uh, that are involved in, in human society with the gender analysis of 
organizations and institutions uh, because this is a world, you know, dominated by large corporations. These are trades conducted by transnational corporations with allowances and um, and permissions and and sometimes hindrance uh, from uh, from post-colonial states governments. Um, but there is a whole area of uh, feminist organization studies, which has, you know, fascinating stuff, including work on transnational corporations uh, and the patterns of masculinity, the relations between different forms of masculinity within the structure of a transnational corporation, the creation of gendered workforces, for instance, of women in the international garment industry, um, and, and so on. There's a, a you know, an exciting and, and really important area of research there. And this new literature is connecting that in new ways with biopolitics, uh, with studies of, of, of bodies, embodiment, and so forth. So there's, you know, room for really extraordinarily interesting new syntheses, I think, there too. Great idea. All right, we have another question from the chat, uh, which are, what do you think the challenges are for gender studies and feminism today? Okay, <laughs> well, let me, let me say, let me suggest two, which I think are really important on a world scale. Um, <clears throat> firstly, Basically, what I've been arguing for in my talk, that is the, the, the challenge of connecting, um, you know, the, the, there is, is feminist radicalism all over the world. There's feminist intellectual work all over the world. There is sexual activist, the gay, trans, other forms of activism in, in just about every part of the world. Sometimes so, you know, oppressed, so hidden that um, that it has difficulty getting into international discussions, but a lot of it is there uh, for the meeting, if you go out and meet it. Now, how we get the resources, the energy, uh, the political will to put resources into making those connections uh, is, I think, a strategic issue for um, social movements now, uh, including feminist movements. Um, so that would be the first challenge, I think. How do we not only make those connections, but keep them going? How do we resource um, uh, intellectual work and movements in under-resourced parts of the world, in, in um, university systems, for instance, where uh, research funding is extremely difficult to come by, or in parts of the world um, where most re social research, for instance, if it's done at all, is funded by NGOs who are basically interested in short-term results on immediate practical issues and are not likely to fund, you know, theoretical work or long-term studies it's not part of their remit so that's the first challenge I, I i point to the second is the rise and and the continued uh, activity and new forms of opposition to feminism uh, to gay rights and to gender studies as a field of knowledge, and it'll be no uh, no secret um, to to most people here, I guess, that gender studies itself is under challenge um, in some parts of Eastern Europe. Um, it is probably under uh, more. I mean, that is open uh, anti-feminist politics drives that uh, a good deal of it connected with with churches and with new right regimes of one kind or another. Um, but some of it is more subliminal. Um, 
I think in the Anglosphere, for instance, when one hears of gender studies programs being defunded or just squeezed or merged into something else, um, there is a political process going on there too. And, of course, there is uh, violent anti-feminism. There's still, uh, you know, violent opposition to um, abortion rights. Um, there, um, there is antagonism to, uh, to women's leadership in politics, which can turn violent. Um, there is violence, for instance, against feminist environmental activists, um, killings um, of human rights protectors, uh, and so forth. So uh, that that challenge, I think, is alive and well today. I mean, we, we have not moved into a, a post-feminist age because feminism has won, and and if we're all feminists now. Um, it's not the case at all. There are new and, I think, quite dangerous um, antagonisms to progressive work in these areas uh, in, in different parts of the world, uh, and they are not going away, and we are going to have to deal with those and evolve forms of cooperation to the extent that these movements are international. Some of the anti-gender movements are now international, we need also international cooperation to deal with them. Thank you. I got a direct message question that asked what some of the tools you think feminism has to answer anti-gender movements. Um, and you answered that a little bit towards the end of your answer to the last question, but I figured I would ask it explicitly in case you had something to add. Yeah, I think the big tool we've got is truth. Uh, I'm not at all postmodernist about this. Um, I think truth is our business as researchers. Um, anyone who is has practical experience of research knows that truth is hard to come by, um, but it can be come by. Um, and um, you know, good. Good information, solid knowledge, insightful theories, the kinds of things that we do try to produce in the academic world are significant parts of an answer to the distortions, lies and, and misinformation um, that is deployed in, in uh, many of these oppositional movements. Cooperation. Um, uh, 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 on an international scale, uh, I, I was suggesting is important, um, and and awareness. I mean, this this stuff is often very unpleasant to work at. I, in one of my other lives, I was a political scientist, and uh, my first book in political science was actually about the extreme right uh, in Australia. Uh, so I got used very early to reading toxic materials. <laughs> Uh, in the course of research, it's no great. It's not great fun, uh, but we do need to be aware of uh, what is going on, of what is being claimed, um, and um, make sure that the, the claims are answered. So there is a, a, a function of outreach, which uh, um, you know intellectuals in our our fields of work um, have a responsibility for, and many do very effectively, um, but, but there's still more to be done. Thank you. I have one more question from the talk. It says, uh, do you see a tension between women's rights and trans rights? No, um, but I'm very well aware of the conflict which um, has arisen uh, between certain strands in, in feminism and certain strands in trans activism, which can be construed, I think, unfortunately, but can be construed as a conflict of interest or a conflict of rights. Um, I've um, 
being a transsexual woman, um, have been conscious of this tension, these tensions, uh, for a long time. Um, the, uh, the issue was articulated, uh, particularly, I think, in the United States, perhaps also to some extent in Britain, uh, in the second half of the 1970s uh, by some feminist thinkers, who gen genuine feminists without the slightest doubt, um, who um, constructed a fairly hostile and derogatory picture of transsexual women, um, which became understood by many people as the feminist uh, position though it never was the only feminist view of, of transsexual women. Um, and uh, the issue has never entirely vanished since. It uh, has flared up and died down from time to time. At the moment, it seems to have flared in particular ways through mass media, where these debates were not very prominent before. Um, I, of course, uh, like many other uh, trans women, are very distressed by this, um, at the, um, and um, uh, feel there must be a solution, um, though one has not yet. Um, uh, been found uh, to the conflict, and given the heated character of some of the exchanges, it's hardly likely to to die out quickly. Um, I don't think there is any fundamental conflict uh, of of interest here. Um, one of the more constructive ways of thinking about it, perhaps. Um, is of recognising the contradictory character of gender as a whole, um, the contradictions between embodiment and social process that are involved in what, in a, a using a term that I don't use, I don't, I don't like. Uh, but in the context of this debate, will we'll be recognised. Cisgender lives are also contradictory in various ways. Gender has, you know, fundamental contradictions in, in its constitution as a form of social life. And in uh, gender transitions, in trans lives, those contradictions take a particular form, particularly in quite a dramatic form, but in other women's lives, they take other forms. Um, so I don't see the a you know categorical difference, if you like, between the different the what are now presented as polarized forms of gender. That's I, I'm sorry I'm not. Um, I'm not engaged in these polemics. I do follow them necessarily, um, and therefore I'm not a skilled practitioner in this um, in this discourse. Um, but I do take note of it. I think there are ways of understanding, at least, uh, which can bring about more connection. Uh, than the polarised debates would, would suggest. The person who asked the question put in the chat, thank you, a great answer within the context of the contradictory nature of gender. Um, your answer actually uh, made me interested in part of what you said, which was that you don't like the term cisgender. Mm. And personally, I was curious if you could tell me a little bit about why. Well, I don't like stark dichotomies ever. And cisgender versus transgender is about the starkest dichotomy I can think of. Um, so uh, as I said long before, you know, when I was 
um, uh, theorizing in a rather simplified way about masculinities and then got into the complex empirical detail, it all suddenly got very much more uh, intricate, elaborate, and, of course, interesting. Um, so the, the positions, the, the various forms of 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 life that develop around or from or embracing gender contradictions are also very complex and I think embrace all of us so that it is simply misleading to say that you know there is a trans group where there's contradiction and a cis group where there's no contradiction that doesn't ring true to me at all Thank you. I appreciate the answer. I don't see any more questions in the chat or any more hands raised, and we're pretty close to the time that uh, our time together expires anyway. So uh, I figure maybe I'll give this the opportunity to break down into informal session. Uh, but I want to thank you so much for being our first launch speaker and thank the audience so much for being a part of this talk. We really appreciate your talk and your answers and your AMA and your interview and all of the time that you spent with the Gender Institute at Royal Holloway. Thank you again so much. Well, um, thank you for having me. As I said at the start, I'm honored to have been invited and I hope this has been a valuable um, experience for you as it has been for me.